Dear students, uh, in the first lecture we discussed about the historical development of materials from time to time from Stone Age to uh, Silicon Age. Now we are coming to the second chapter that is atomic structure and interatomic bondings. Uh, about the atom, you know that atom is the basic fundamental block of uh, matter. Atom jo hai, wo matter ka fundamental block hai, chota, chota zarra hai, uh, jis se matter sara milke bana hai. Isko agar aap dekh le, isko atom ke baare mein thodi history jo hai, main aapko bata ke de deta hoon ki how is history. I am going to go to YouTube and from there you can hear clearly and you can see the history, a small short history of atom. Ki atom ko kis tarah logo ne identify kiya aur uske baare mein kya kaha. Pher uspe baad mein hum aate hain iske different theories jo hain wo bhi discuss karenge waqt ke saath saath. Maksad iska ye hain ki I want to make you to how to use your um, YouTube or uh, Google to uh, get knowledge from it. So come to the short video about the atom, uh, what an atom is, who created the idea, who floated the idea of atom, kisne atom ka idea float kiya, wo thoda sa ab zara mulahizai ki is. What is an atom and how do we know? Atoms are the fundamental building blocks of chemistry. <coughs> Just like baked goods are made of a collection of different types of ingredients, matter itself is made of a collection of different types of atoms. Scientists have discovered 118 kinds of atoms, which we call elements. You can find them laid out on a chart called the periodic table. All things from the screen this video is displayed on to the eyeballs with which you're watching it are made of atoms. But a single atom is so small it is impossible to see with the naked eye. So there you have it. A random voice from a video you found on the internet claims that everything is made from invisibly small atoms. You may now blindly accept this as fact and happily move on with your day, right? No? <laughs> now you are extra curious? You want to know for yourself exactly why it is that scientists think they know that atoms exist? Well. To find out, we must travel back in time to ancient Greece. Meet Democritus, the man that many historians credit for first clearly proposing the idea of an atom. In his day, it was thought by some that if you were to chop up a piece of matter, an apple for instance, you could just keep on chopping forever and ever. There was no end to smallness. For reasons not fully agreed upon by historians, this concept did not sit well with Democritus. Instead, he insisted that at some point, you would reach particles so small and so indestructible, they could not be divided any further. He called them atomos, or atoms, which means uncuttable. Now, Democritus didn't actually have any evidence to back up his claim, and because of that, many people simply rejected it. After all, that which can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. Let's fast forward several hundred years and hop on over to the Arabic world. You probably know that salt can be extracted from seawater by simply letting it evaporate or boiling it dry. People have been doing this forever, but alchemist Jabir ibn Hayyan and those that followed his work took the science of extraction to a whole new level. Through careful experimentation, they developed complex processes of filtration, boiling, vapor collection, and cooling. They found that crude starting materials could be divided into multiple incredibly pure substances. Pure meaning they appeared to be consistent all the way through, unlike the complex mixtures of matter often found in nature. In the 1700s, a French husband and wife scientific duo, Marianne Poults and Antoine Lavoisier, studied and built upon the work of their Arabic predecessors. They found that certain pure substances could be broken down even further through chemical reactions. Water, for example, can be boiled into steam, which is still water, but it can also be split into two pure gases, hydrogen and oxygen. No matter how hard the couple tried, however, they could not reduce oxygen or hydrogen into simpler gases. They concluded that the gases must be elements. 
foundational substances that cannot be created by mixing other chemicals together and cannot be broken down any further. With this concept in mind, scientists everywhere began searching for and listing as many elements as they could, eventually discovering all 118 listed on the modern periodic table. Some, such as oxygen and hydrogen, are gases at room temperature. Others are solid, such as elemental carbon and gold. Others still are liquid at room temperature, mercury and bromine. It was also found that under the right conditions, pressure and temperature, Certain elements will react with each other upon mixing to form new substances with new properties. These are called compounds. The elements oxygen and iron can react to form a brown powder known as rust. Oxygen and mercury react to form a toxic orange powder. Oxygen and hydrogen react to form a clear, refreshing liquid. You probably know it as water. Though the steps may be complicated, all of these reactions can be reversed. Elements can be re-separated, and the amount of each element we get back after separation is always exactly equal to the amount that had reacted to form the compound in the first place. Wonderful. Elements are real, and they appear to be essentially indestructible, but what are they made of? If you were to zoom in on one, a chunk of pure gold, for example, can you just keep zooming in forever and ever, seeing nothing but pure gold for infinity? In the early 1800s, a school teacher from England named John Dalton grew fascinated with chemistry. Along with conducting several experiments of his own, he read about every experiment he possibly could, paying special attention to the quantities of each element used up in every chemical reaction. In these numbers, he was surprised to find a pattern emerge. When two elements can react to form multiple types of compounds, they always do so in small, whole number ratios. In this example here, we see that in order to transform a gram of carbon into pure carbon monoxide, we need to add 1.33 grams of oxygen. To turn a gram of carbon into pure carbon dioxide, we need to add exactly twice as much oxygen. That's 2.66 grams. This, and many other similar observations, strongly suggest that oxygen and other elements are made of tiny, indivisible units. Atoms. He didn't know exactly how small an atom was, but the numbers suggested that the atoms of a single element were all nearly identical in size to each other, but different in size to the atoms found in other elements. In 1808, he wrote a 560-page book that briefly mentioned his discovery. It even came with some quite beautiful drawings. While scientists weren't fully convinced that atoms were real, they did find the concept of atoms extremely useful. It helped them make accurate predictions and perform cleaner chemical reactions. In 1905, Albert Einstein, hold on there, in 1905 he was quite a bit younger than that. There we go. In 1905, Albert Einstein proposed an experiment and produced an equation that could be used not only to confirm the existence of atoms, but to determine exactly how big they are. A few years later, French physicist Jean Perrin, or I guess in French that would be something a little more like Jean Perrin, used Einstein's concept to actually do the experiments confirming beyond reasonable doubt, at least to other physicists and mathematicians, that atoms do, in fact, exist. Now, if you happen to love math and possess an in-depth understanding of physics, then great, you can just turn off this video right now and go read his book. But for the rest of us, a little visual confirmation that atoms actually do exist would be nice, right? Unfortunately, individual atoms are far too small to be seen with normal light. The wavelength of light is just too great. This means that normal microscopes cannot see atoms. In the 70s, a group of engineers led by Gerd Benig and Heinrich Rohrer began working on what they called the Scanning Tunneling Microscope, a microscope they hoped would let us take undistorted images of many different types of atoms. It uses a process called electron tunneling to scan and essentially feel the surface of the sample, much like you can feel around in the dark to get a picture of your surroundings. This is an actual scan of silicon atoms forming the surface of a crystal. The colors here are artificial, but this is real data showing the actual pattern of silicon atoms arranged in the sample. Later work by Dr. Wilson Ho improved the technique and cleaned up the presentation of data. While, quote, feeling the atoms does give us good information. 
Okay, gentlemen, you heard about a little bit about the history of an atom. के एटम क्या हैं वो उसको मैटर का फंडामेंटल ब्लॉक कहा जाता है ये इनिशियली विजुअलाइज नहीं था जो जो मॉडर्न टेक्निक्स आ गए उसके साथ माइक्रोस्कोप स्कैनिंग इलेक्ट्रॉन माइक्रोस्कोप और इस तरह टनलिंग इलेक्ट्रॉन माइक्रोस्कोप जो हैं ट्रांसमिशन इलेक्ट्रॉन माइक्रोस्कोप ये जो आ गए तो उसके बाद से एटम जो हैं उसकी स्पाट्स वगैरह जो आना शुरू तो स्पाट से एटम की डिटेक्शन शुरू होगी कि हाँ ये एटम मैं मैटर जो है वो एटमों से मिल के बना है और उसमें और क्या क्या चीज़ें वो बाद में आती जाएगी तो सबसे पहले जो था डाल्टन्स एटामिक थीवरी पे हम आते हैं कि डाल्टन्स एटामिक थीवरी क्या थी डाल्टन्स ने क्या कर दिया उन्होंने कह दिया कि एटम इज़ द स्मॉलेस्ट पार्ट ऑफ मैटर इट इज़ द टाइनीस्ट पार्ट ऑफ मैटर एटम जो है वो सबसे छोटा तरीन जर्रा है किसका मैटर का उन्होंने ये भी कहा कि एटम इज़ इंडिविजिबल ये इंडिविजिबल है यानी इसको जितना भी आप क्या करोगे हैमर भी करोगे जो भी करोगे उससे आप छोटे हिस्सों में तकसीम नहीं कर सकते इट कान बी क्रिएटेड आर डिस्ट्रॉयड इसको न तो आप क्रिएट कर सकते हैं न आप डिस्ट्रॉय कर सकते डिस्ट्रॉय कर सकते हैं इन फर्दर सब पार्टिकल आर फ्रेगमेंट्स अब जनाब ने ये है कि एटम्स ऑफ सेम एलिमेंट्स है सेम प्रॉपर्टी दे आर आइडेंटिकल इन मासेस दे आर आइडेंटिकल इन दियर केमिकल प्रॉपर्टीज़ लेकिन इनमें कुछ ड्रॉबैक्स भी थी ये जो एटम का जो क्या है इंडिविजिबिलिटी का कॉन्सेप्ट है वो भी ख़त्म हो गया कि बाद में इलेक्ट्रॉन डिस्कवर हो गए जो बाद में हम डिस्कस कर रहे हैं जे जे तामसन ने डिस्कवर कर दिए इसी तरह प्रोटॉन डिस्कवर्ड हो गए रदर फोर्ड ठीक है ना इसी तरह न्यूट्रॉन डिस्कवर हो गए जिसको चैडविक ने डिस्कवर कर दिया सो अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल हैव डन वर्क ऑन दैट अब जनाब हम आते हैं आपको उसी तरह जिस तरह के मैंने पहला वो क्लिप पेश किया हम दोबारा जाते हैं यूट्यूब की तरफ ताकि यूट्यूब से आपको दोबारा इन्हीं चीज़ों को जो मैंने आपको कर दिया तो आप क्लैरिटी के लिए ताकि आपके अजहान में और भी ये आइडिया आसानी से क्या हो जाए फ्लोट हो जाए नाओ सी the daltons atomic theory the loss of chemical combinations created ripples in the stagnant pool of chemistry they enabled scientists to carry out various experiments that helped in forming strong foundations in chemistry however the law still needed experimental evidences and proofs only then would they be accepted It was around the first decade of the 19th century that a chemist and a physicist from England named John Dalton was successful in answering many questions. He proposed a theory which was then known as the Dalton's atomic theory. With this theory, many concepts regarding matter, composition of matter, atoms and even combinations of atoms resulting in compounds were better understood. Okay, let's first take a very quick look at the six major postulates of his theory. First, he said that all matter is made up of very tiny particles called atoms. Secondly, he suggested that atoms are indivisible particles which cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Third postulate was atoms of a given element are identical in mass and chemical properties. Similarly, fourth postulate was that atoms of different elements have different masses and chemical properties. Fifth postulate stated that atoms combine in a ratio of small whole numbers to form compounds. And lastly, the relative number and kinds of atoms are constant in a given compound. I know I just rattled off the postulates. Don't worry. Let us now understand each postulate one by one by taking the same example of elements A and B giving rise to compound C. The first point stated that all matter is made up of very tiny particles called atoms. It means that when we go on dividing matter into smaller and smaller sections, what we get at the end is atoms. So can we say that elements A and B are made up of atoms? Yes. In fact, compound C is also made up of atoms that have combined together. So the first postulate was very easy to understand. The second postulate was that atoms are indivisible particles which cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Now what do we mean by this? Yes, it means that atoms are like the fundamental units. Dividing them further is not possible. Also, in a chemical reaction, 
atoms may combine together to form new units. However, no new atoms can be created and existing ones cannot be destroyed. So in this case, the atoms of element A and B are just combining to form compound C. So can we say that no new atoms are formed in this case? Yes, and similarly, no atom is destroyed. Let's move on to the third one now. The third postulate states that atoms of a given element are identical in mass and chemical properties. If we zoom into the element A, we find all the atoms that make up element A are just the same. And in what sense are these same? The atoms have identical mass as well as chemical properties. In simple words, the third postulate states that all atoms of a given element are identical. And does this explain the fourth postulate too? Yes, the fourth postulate states that atoms of different elements have different masses and chemical properties. So are we able to notice that atoms in element A are different from those in element B? Absolutely. And in what sense are they different? Atoms in element A and B have different masses and even different chemical properties. In simple words, it states that atoms of different elements are different. The fifth postulate states that atoms combine in a ratio of small whole numbers to form compounds. Now what do we mean by this? In this chemical reaction, we find elements A and B reacting and giving us the compound C. If we observe well, a unit of compound C has two atoms of element A and one atom of element B. Right? So aren't these whole numbers? Yes. This means that in any compound, the elements are always present in a ratio which comprises of whole numbers. You will not find half or three-fourth atom combining with the other. In case of water, we always have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom combining to form one unit. In one unit of carbon dioxide, we have one carbon and two oxygen atoms. The same holds true for all compounds. The number of atoms of a particular element in a compound will always be a whole number. Now for the last one. The sixth postulate states that the relative number and kinds of atoms are constant in a given compound. The same explanation that compound C has two atoms of element A and one of element B makes us understand this. Yes. If we scan compound C, we will always find two atoms of element A and one atom of element B in a single unit. And this is applicable for all compounds. We've already looked at two examples, water and carbon dioxide. In case of one unit of water, we always have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And in a single unit of carbon dioxide, we have one carbon and two oxygen atoms. Carbon monoxide has one atom of each, that is carbon and oxygen. While one unit of ammonia always has one nitrogen atom bound to three hydrogen atoms. So the number of atoms will always be constant in a unit of a particular compound. In a nutshell, all these postulates help chemists to further understand behaviours of elements and the compounds formed from them. But for understanding these elements and compounds, knowing the concept of atoms is necessary. Let's get to know what exactly these atoms are, how they exist, their mass and many such interesting concepts in the upcoming videos. Okay, so you have seen that the atom पहले मैंने थोड़ी सी हिस्ट्री डिस्क्राइब की फिर मैंने रदरफोर्ड का जो कांसेप्ट था वो भी फ्लोट कर दिया आई एम वेरी मच थैंकफुल टू गूगल एज वेल एज यूट्यूब फॉर गिविंग सच नाइस वीडियोस दैट इज अ क्लियर विजुअलाइजेशन एवरीथिंग इज देयर स्टूडेंट मस्ट बी एनकरेज टू वॉच सच टाइप ऑफ स्मॉल क्लिप शॉर्ट क्लिप्स फॉर देयर अंडरस्टैंडिंग so now next we are going to go to another um, atomic this is jj thompson about the jj thompson thank you for watching okay next is uh, jj thompson or jj thompson ne kya kar diya 
1897 में इलेक्ट्रॉन को डिस्कवर कर दिया गैस डिस्चार्ज एक्सपेरिमेंट कर रहे थे तो उन्होंने उसमें इलेक्ट्रॉन को डिस्कवर कर दिया और इस तरह एटम की इनडिविजिबिलिटी का कॉन्सेप्ट जो था यहाँ से फिर जो है वो कमज़ोर होना शुरू हो गया और उस पर मज़ीद काम शुरू हो गया तो उन्होंने इलेक्ट्रॉन को डिस्कवर कर दिया और उन्होंने कहा कि एटम जो है इस ये पॉजिटिव चार्ज और नेगेटिव चार्ज इलेक्ट्रॉन पर मुश्तमिल हैं ऑल टुगेदर ये क्या है ये न्यूट्रल हैं पॉजिटिव चार्जेस और नेगेटिव चार्जेस की तादाद आपस में बराबर हैं और उन्होंने ये कहा कि बिल्कुल इस तरह इस पॉजिटिव चार्जेस पे इलेक्ट्रॉन इस तरह पड़े हुए हैं जिस तरह आप कीर मैक्स वगैरह होते हैं उस पर आप बादाम वगैरह जो है वो स्प्रिंकल कर लेते हैं टॉप पे या पुडिंग वगैरह होती हैं इसलिए उसको प्लम पुडिंग मॉडल का नाम भी दे दिया गया था यानी उन्होंने ये कॉन्सेप्ट दे दिया जिसमें एटम की स्टेबिलिटी वगैरह जो थी वो एक्सप्लेन नहीं थी कि एटम की स्टेबिलिटी क्यों है और कैसे हैं उसमें और भी बहुत से कॉम्प्लिकेशन थे तो आइए हम देखते हैं इस वीडियो में थोड़े बहुत उसके बारे में जो इन्फॉर्मेशन है शार्ट इन्फॉर्मेशन भी Other charged particles arranged in any particular manner. Are the charged particles spread throughout the atom, or are they concentrated in one place? To answer these questions, let's go back in time. Dalton's atomic theory stated that an atom was indivisible and indestructible. However, in 1886. Goldstein came upon positively charged radiations in a gas discharge which he termed as canal rays. These radiations led to the discovery of the proton. The mass of a proton was about 2000 times that of an electron and it carried a positive charge. Around the year 1900, J.J. Thomson conducted experiments on the beams of particles inside a glass tube called a cathode ray tube he found that the particles were attracted to the positive terminal of the tube thomson concluded that the particles must be negatively charged and called these particles electrons an electron has a negligible mass and has a charge of minus 1 these discoveries Many the scientists believed that an atom was divisible and made up of electrons and protons what they didn't know at the time was how these electrons and protons were arranged within an atom they tried to understand this arrangement through various experiments jj thompson was the first to put forward a model to explain the structure of an atom in his model Thomson compared an atom to a Christmas pudding. The electrons were like the raisins in the pudding, and the pudding itself was like the positively charged particles. This can also be explained through the example of a watermelon. The positive charge in the atom is spread all over like the red fleshy part of the watermelon, while the electrons are embedded into the atoms like the seeds of the watermelon. The oppositely charged particles are held together by electrical force of attraction. Thomson concluded that an atom consists of a positively charged sphere with electrons set within the sphere. An atom is electrically neutral as the positive and negative charges within it are equal. As per Thomson's conclusion, the electrons were embedded in a sphere of positive charge. This conclusion, however, was incorrect. Thomson asserted that the positive charge spread through the atom held the negatively charged electrons due to electrical forces. This assertion failed to explain many experimental observations. In this module, 
you have learnt that atoms are made of charged particles. According to Thomson's model, an atom is a positively charged sphere with electrons set within it. An atom is electrically neutral. Shortcomings of Thomson's model are his incorrect assumptions. Electrons are embedded in positive charge. Positive charge in the atom holds the negatively charged electrons. इलेक्ट्रॉन का स्टेटिक कॉन्सेप्ट दे दिया उन्होंने की इलेक्ट्रॉन जो है वो पॉजिटिव चार्जेस पे इस तरह पड़े हुए हैं जिस तरह के किशमिश होता है बादाम होता है उसको आप कस्टर्ड पे रख लेते हो या कीर वगैरह पे आप क्या कर लेते हो उसको रख लेते हो तो उसी तरह उसमें एम्बीडेड है यानी इलेक्ट्रॉन को पॉजिटिव चार्जेस ने होल्ड किया है तो उन्होंने ये कॉन्सेप्ट दिया कि एटम इज ए होल जो हैं वो क्या है वो न्यूट्रल हैं और उन्होंने स्टेटिक कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन दे दिया जो उसके शार्ट शार्ट कमिंग्स थी यानी जो उसकी कोताहियाँ थी जो उनकी कमज़ोरियाँ थी कि उन्होंने ये कॉन्सेप्ट दे दिया कि इलेक्ट्रॉन को होल्ड किया हुआ है किसने पॉजिटिव चार्जेस ने और वो रेस्ट में हैं और फिर उसके बाद जो है रदर आ गया रदर ने अपनी थीवरी जो है वो प्रजेंट की या मॉडल जो है वो प्रजेंट की तो रदर ने नाइनटीन में उसने क्या किया रदर फोर्ड गोल्ड फाइल गोल्ड फाइल विद एल्फा पार्टिकल एल्फा पार्टिकल और डबल पॉजिटिव चार्ज पार्टिकल एंड मासिव पार्टिकल सो न्यूक्लियर रेडिएशन में एल्फा बीटा गेमा रेडिएशन जो एमिट होते हैं तो एल्फा जो है इस पे प्लस टू चार्ज होता है चार्ज उसका सबसे ज़्यादा होता है और ये सबसे न्यूक्लियर रेडिएशन में जो है वो मासव होते हैं उसकी पेनिट्रेशन पावर कम होती है वगैरह वगैरह ये हो तो उधर जो है न्यूक्लियर फेजेस का वो काम है उसमें तो रदर फोर्ड ने क्या कर दिया रदर फोर्ड बम्बारेड अ गोल्ड फाइल विद अल्फा पार्टिकल और उन्होंने ये देखा ही फाउंड दैट मेजॉरिटी ऑफ द अल्फा पार्टिकल पास्ट स्ट्रेट कि मेजॉरिटी ऑफ द अल्फा पार्टिकल उसमें से सीधे निकल गए और चंद एक पार्टिकल जो है लार्ज एंगल से क्या कर गए डिविएट कर गए फ्यू अल्फा पार्टिकल वर स्केटर्ड वर डिविएटेड इन डिफरेंट ट्रैक्स एंड सम वर टर्न बैक एट एन एंगल ऑफ वन एटी डिग्री और उससे फिर रदर फोर्ड ने जो कुछ एजम्पन्स किए वो ये थे कि रदर फोर्ड ने कहा कि जो जो ज़्यादा पार्टिकल सीधे गुजर गए तो इसका मतलब ये हुआ कि मोस्ट पार्ट पार्ट ऑफ एन एटम इज एम टी के एटम का मैक्मम हिस्सा जो है वो एम टी है इसलिए कसरत से जो अल्फा पार्टिकल वो सीधे निकल गए ज़्यादा अल्फा पार्टिकल जो हैं वो स्ट्रेट चले गए और इस वजह से उन्होंने कहा कि एटम का मैक्सिमम पोर्शन जो है वो एम होता है और उसने दूसरा ये कहा कि एटम के अंदर एक ऐसा ये जो डिविएशन ऑफ पार्टिकल्स हो गई जो स्केटरिंग ऑफ पार्टिकल्स हो गई डिफरेंट एंगल्स पे या वन पे तो उससे उसने कहा कि एटम के अंदर एक कोर पार्ट मौजूद है जिसमें पॉजिटिव चार्ज रिजाइड करता है जिसको बाद में प्रोटॉन्स का नाम दे दिया गया पॉजिटिव चार्जेस रिजाइड करते हैं और ये हेवीएस्ट पार्ट है किसका एटम का दैट इज द हेवीएस्ट पार्ट ऑफ द एटम यानी रदर फोर्ड के मुताबिक जो था इसके जो एटम है एटम के अंदर एक स्मॉल कोर पोर्शन मौजूद है जिसके अंदर हाई पॉजिटिव चार्जेस रिजॉल्व करते हैं और उसका मास सबसे ज़्यादा है और उसकी वजह से चूँकि पॉजिटिव पॉजिटिव चार्ज एक दूसरे को रिपेल करते हैं कूल अमला की वजह से तो आप देख रहे हैं कि किसी को हल्का डिफ्लेक्ट कर दिया किसी को ज़्यादा डिफ्लेक्ट कर दिया और किसी को वापस रिफ्लेक्ट कर दिया तो उससे उन्होंने कहा कि ये एक बाद में इस कोर पोर्शन को न्यूक्लियस का नाम दे दिया गया क्या नाम दे दिया गया न्यूक्लियस का नाम देट कोर पोर्शन वॉज नेम्ड एज न्यूक्लियस तो रदर फोर्ड ने ये कहा कि इलेक्ट्रॉन्स जो हैं वो क्या करते हैं रिवॉल्व करते हैं अराउंड दी सेंट्रल पार्ट 
of the uh, around that central part jis is central part ko baad mein kya naam de diya gaya nucleus ka naam de diya gaya in me bhi drawbacks thi aur ye drawbacks ye thi ke bilkul unhone planetary system ko ye liya tha jis tarah suraj ke gird jo hai wo mukhtalif planet jo hai wo revolve karte hain earth is revolving around the system uh, around the sun ये तमाम चीज़ें उनको मद नज़र रखते हुए उनके बेस पे उन्होंने कहा कि जो न्यूक्लियस हैं इलेक्ट्रॉन उसके गिरद क्या करते हैं रिवॉल्व करते हैं लेकिन उसमें ये था कि उस वक्त जो थे इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक थीवरी के बारे में ये था कि जब भी कोई चार्ज पार्टिकल क्या होता है एक्सेलरेटेड होता है तो वो एनर्जी को रेडिएट करता है एनर्जी को लास करता है तो रदर फोर्ड के मुताबिक ये अगर एनर्जी को लास करता है तो ये एक वक्त ऐसा आ जाएगा कि लास्ट करते करते ये क्या होगा न्यूक्लियस के अंदर गिर जाएगा और एटम की स्टेबिलिटी नहीं रहेगी वगैरह और भी उसके वो थे डिटेल स्टडी के लिए आप जो हैं वो बुक्स पे जाएं मटेरियल साइंसेस की बुक्स जो हैं आप जाएं जो रिकमेंडेड बुक है कैलिएस्टर वाला है का कहानी वाला है उस पर जाओ डिटेल से अब हम जो है आते हैं थोड़ा सा उसको डिस्प्ले करते हैं कि इसका एटामिक मॉडल रदर का क्या था और ये देखो इस छोटी सी वीडियो में The plum pudding model of an atom was one of the most widely accepted models all over the world for understanding the structure of the atom. However, several experiments performed by scientists to study the atomic structure showed astonishingly different results. They were contradicting the plum pudding model. This led many scientists all over the globe to reconsider the structure of an atom and study it again. Around the year 1911, a British physicist Ernst Rutherford carried out the famous gold foil experiment. He did this to understand the structure of an atom. The experiment was carried out by Rutherford along with Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden. The experiment he performed was a breakthrough in the field of chemistry which helped him understand the structure of an atom in a more accurate manner. This is how the setup of his experiment looked like. As we can see here he used a source of alpha particles locked in a lead container with a very small slit this ensured that the alpha particles only came out through a small opening and traveled in a straight line but why did he select alpha particles in the first place well the alpha particles were having high energy and were heavier as well so if we say the atom is like a pudding of positively charged particles with electrons embedded in it then the particles will pass straight through it this is obvious because the heavier particles will pierce through the lighter pudding structure of the atom and pass through it this is what rutherford thought for this reason their greater mass and energy compared to the protons made him choose alpha particles for the experiment next he used a very thin gold foil on which the alpha particles would bombard why did he choose a gold foil Well, a really thin gold foil was estimated to contain approximately 1000 atoms. Lesser the atoms, more convenient the experiment would be. Lastly, are we able to locate this circular band with a gap here? What could this be? Well, this is a screen, a fluorescent screen that would help us detect the radiation. That means the screen will glow or emit fluorescent light whenever alpha particles will hit it. So this is how the track of alpha particles can be traced. Now we're all set to understand how the experiment worked. The alpha particles were emitted from the element present in this box. These directly hit the gold foil. Now what should happen ideally? As we know the Thomson's model suggested that an atom is a sphere of positive charge with negative electrons embedded inside it. That means it is expected that the alpha particles will pass right through the atoms and hit the detector straight. And why so? Because the mass of alpha particles is heavier than the mass of positive charges. That means they should directly hit the atom and move ahead through it. Only a very small deviation would probably be acceptable in this case. But is this what he observed? Not really. He was astonished to get unexpected results. What results did he get? He found that most of the fast moving alpha particles passed straight through the foil and hit the detector. However, some particles got deflected by small angles. And lastly to his astonishment, few alpha particles also rebounded. 
Now, how can this be possible? These three observations made Rutherford think that the plum pudding model is not really correct. Based on the conclusions he had, he put forward the new hypothesis explaining the structure of atoms. Rutherford's gold foil experiment gave him interesting results. What results did he get, by the way? Let me recall them for you. He found that most of the fast-moving alpha particles passed straight through the foil and hit the detector. However, some particles got deflected by small angles. And lastly, to his astonishment, few alpha particles also rebounded. Now, how can this be possible? These three observations made Rutherford think that the plum pudding model is not really correct. Let us take a simplified example to understand the inferences first. Let us imagine that we have a ball made up of cotton. The cotton in the ball is very sparsely distributed and has an extremely tiny circle or sphere located at the center. This sphere is quite hard and dense. So hard that it can even resist a bullet shot against it. Now what will happen if you shoot many bullets across this cotton ball? Most of them will travel straight through the cotton surface. What will happen if a bullet hits the edge of the central heavy mass? In this case, the bullet will slightly change their path and get deviated. So looking at the size of the central mass, it's obvious that only some of the bullets will get deviated. Lastly, what happens when a bullet hits the center directly? Needless to say, it will bounce back. Because we know that the central dense mass is too hard for the bullet to pass through. So very few bullets will bounce back. This is analogous to what Rutherford had inferred about the atomic structure. His first conclusion was that most of the space inside an atom is empty. This is because most of the alpha particles could easily pass through the atoms and hit the detector straight. Now, if most of the space is empty inside an atom, then where is the positive charge located? Well, that's the second conclusion. The positive charge is compactly packed in a tiny entity. This occupies an extremely small space inside the atom. Now, why did he think so? Let's go back to our cotton ball and bullet example. Can you recall the second and the third case? Yes. The bullets get deviated on hitting the tiny sphere of the edge and they will rebound when they hit the center. Same explanation holds true for this. A few alpha particles get deviated. That means there is a possibility that these hit the edge of the positive center. Yes, and one more possibility is that they get deviated because the positive center repels the alpha particles as they are also positively charged. Also, a very small number of alpha particles rebounded. That means there is a possibility that these alpha particles had directly hit the positive center. But since the number of these rebounding particles is too small, it explains that the volume occupied by the positive center is also very small. If the space occupied would have been big enough, then the number of alpha particles bouncing back would also be greater. So let's say there are gold particles in the foil. He found that most of the rays pass straight through the atoms. A few rays change their path and get deflected. Lastly, very few particles bounce back. These results compelled Rutherford to come up with a new nuclear model. Let's have a look at the hypothesis put forward by him. Firstly, there is a positively charged center in an atom called nucleus. Nearly all the mass of an atom resides in the nucleus. Secondly, the electrons revolve around the nucleus in circular paths. Thirdly, the size of the nucleus is very small compared to the size of an atom. However, theoretically, there were many flaws in the hypothesis. Let's have a look at the drawbacks in Rutherford's hypothesis in the next video. और उन ड्रॉबैक्स को देखने के लिए आपको जो मैंने बुक्स रिकमेंड की हैं थोड़ा सा आप अपने ऊपर भी प्रेशर डाल दिया करो ये पेंडेमिक सिचुएशन है तो हम कोशिश करते हैं कि आपको ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा डिलीवर करके दे दें अच्छा जी तो आपने देखा कि जब इलेक्ट्रॉन क्या करता है रिवॉल्व करता है अराउंड द न्यूक्लियस 
तो उसमें एक्सेलरेशन होती है इसको सेंट्रीपीटल एक्सेलरेशन कहते हैं तो रदर फोर्ड ने जब कहा कि इलेक्ट्रॉन रिवॉल्व करता है न्यूक्लियस के इर्द गिर्द तो आपको मालूम होगा कि इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक वेव्स कब जनरेट होती हैं वेन एवर अ चार्ज पार्टिकल इज एक्सेलरेटेड जब भी कोई चार्ज पार्टिकल एक्सेलरेटेड होता है तब जो है वो इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक वेव्स जो हैं वो रेडिएट होती हैं या वो एमिट होती हैं तो रदर फोर्ड के मुताबिक यानी रदर फोर्ड का जो ड्राबिक मैं बता रहा हूँ कि जब ये इलेक्ट्रॉन रिवॉल्व करता है न्यूक्लियस तो उसमें सेंट्रीपीटल एक्सेलरेशन होगी बिकॉज ऑफ द चेंज इन डायरेक्शन ऑफ मोशन और ये इलेक्ट्रॉन कॉन्स्टेंटली क्या करेगा एनर्जी को लूज करता जाएगा लूज करता जाएगा और आखिरकार ये न्यूक्लियस में गिर जाएगा जब न्यूक्लियस तो एटम की स्टेबिलिटी ही नहीं रहेगी तो दैट वॉज द ड्राबेक फिर इसके बाद जो है नील बोहर्स आया और उन्होंने अपनी एटामिक तीवरी प्रजेंट की ये क्वांटम मैकेनिकल कॉन्सेप्ट उसमें कुछ इस्तेमाल किया तो उसमें उस तीवरी के मुताबिक उसके एजम्पन्स जो हैं वो कुछ यूँ थे कि इलेक्ट्रॉन जो होता है वो रिवाल अराउंड द सर्कुलर आर्बिट अराउंड द न्यूक्लियस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स रिवाल्व अराउंड द न्यूक्लियस इन अ सर्कुलर स्टेशनरी आर्बिट्स ड्यू टू कूलम्स फोर्स ऑफ अट्रैक्शन न्यूक्लियस जो होता है वो पॉजिटिवली चार्ज होता है और इलेक्ट्रॉन जो होता है वो नेगेटिवली चार्ज होता है तो इलेक्ट्रॉन रिवाल्व करता है न्यूक्लियस के गिर्द ड्यू टू कोलम्बिक फोर्सेज दूसरा ये है कि ये थी कि एनर्जी ऑफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इन ईच आर्बिट इज फिक्स्ड एनर्जी ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन इन ईच आर्बिट इज फिक्स्ड यानी पहले वाले आर्बिट में अपनी होगी दूसरे में अपनी होगी लेकिन वो उसकी मकदार फिक्स होगी मीनिंग दैट एनर्जी इज क्वान्टाइज क्वान्टाइजेशन का कॉन्सेप्ट उसने दे दिया कंटीन्यूटी का कॉन्सेप्ट यानी जिस तरह फ्लूड कंटिन्यू से उसका कॉन्सेप्ट नहीं दिया कि एनर्जी जो है पहले शेल में अपनी एनर्जी होगी दूसरे में अपनी होगी तीसरे में अपनी होगी चौथी में अपनी होगी तो हर एक शेल की अपनी अपनी क्या होगी एनर्जी होगी सो दैट विल बी द एनर्जी सो द एनर्जी ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन इन ईच आर्बिट इज फैक्सड यानी उसकी वैल्यू कांस्टेंट होगी ये ये कॉन्ट्रेडक्ट ही है किस चीज़ की इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक तेवरी की कि जब भी इलेक्ट्रॉन दिवाल करता है न्यूक्लियस के गिर तो वो एक्सेलरेटेड होता है तो वो एनर्जी को लूज करता जाएगा और कम होता जाएगा दैट इज़ अ कंट्रीडक्टरी टू दैट वन अब आते हैं इलेक्ट्रॉन विल लूज एनर्जी जब आप एक क्या इलेक्ट्रॉन हाइयर स्टेट से लोअर में आता है वेन इलेक्ट्रॉन इज कमिंग फ्राम अपर स्टेट टू लोअर स्टेट इल लूज इज एनर्जी इक्वल टू द एनर्जी डिफरेंस बिटवीन द टू आर्बिट्स जब भी इलेक्ट्रॉन uh, क्या आता है हाई एनर्जी से लोअर में आता है तो ये एनर्जी को लॉस करता है और इक्वल टू द एनर्जी डिफरेंस बिटवीन द टू स्टेट्स तो ये देखो E2 टू माइनस ई वन ई टू माइनस ई वन ई टू से जम करके ई वन तो एच एफ के बराबर है इसी तरह अगर आपने किसी इलेक्ट्रॉन को लोअर स्टेट से ऊपर में ले जाना है तो आपने उतनी ही एनर्जी देनी है इस लोअर स्टेट इलेक्ट्रॉन को ताकि वो उसको बिल्कुल ऊपर उठाए दैट विल बी इक्वल टू द एनर्जी डिफरेंस ऑफ द टू शाल्स नेक्स्ट वाला जो एजम्पन था वो कहते हैं कि द इंगुलर मोमेंटम इन ईच आर्बिट इज फैक्सड इंगुलर मोमेंटम इन ईच आर्बिट इज फैक्स हर आर्बिट में इंगुलर मोमेंटम फैक्सड है एंड इट इज द इंटीग्रल मल्टीपल ऑफ एच बाई टू पाई एच इज अ प्लान कॉन्स्टेंट एंड टू पाई सो एच बाई टू पाई फर्स्ट आर्बिट में एच बाई टू पाई होगा दूसरे में एच बाई पाई होगा तीसरे में ठीक है तीसरे में थ्री एच बाई टू पाई होगा और इसी तरह हर आर्बिट के अंदर इंगुलर मोमेंटम जो होता है उसकी फैक्सड वैल्यू होती हैं जो कि उस पर्टिकुलर आर्बिट के लिए क्या होगी फैक्स होगी नाउ वी आर कमिंग टू डिस्प्ले दिस थिंग्स इन फ्रंट ऑफ यू इन अ वेरी स्मॉल वीडियो क्लिप We know that any charged object which revolves in a circular motion gains acceleration gradually. Similarly, if the electron is moving fast in a circular path, then it will also gain acceleration. And on gaining acceleration, it's bound to liberate energy in some form. Now, if it continuously keeps radiating energy, then ultimately all the energy of the electron will get over and it will fall into the nucleus. This would result in high instability of the atom. But wait a second, all these things do not happen in an atom. And how do we know this? Because in nature, all the atoms are stable. That means the hypothesis put forth by Rutherford was also incorrect. 
Not really. The hypothesis just needed slight modifications. These were made by the next legendary scientist in our list called Niels Bohr. He made a few additional explanations to describe the atomic structure. The postulates put forward by Niels Bohr were as follows. Firstly, only certain special orbits called discrete orbits of electrons are allowed inside the atom. Secondly, while revolving in these discrete orbits, the electrons do not radiate energy. Now these points definitely tell us why an atom is so stable. But what exactly are these paths or orbits in which the electrons revolve around the nucleus? Let's understand with an example. Do you know how our solar system is? Yes, it appears somewhat like this. Now here, the sun is stationary at the center while the planets revolve around it. But have you noticed that the planets always revolve in fixed paths? We never find any planet jumping to a different path all of a sudden, right? They always encircle the sun in defined paths. In a similar way, we have the atomic structure. The nucleus acts like the sun located at the center. And the electrons are like planets which revolve in fixed defined orbitals. These electron orbitals are referred to as shells or energy levels. Now the name energy levels gets us to an important concept. Niels Bohr suggested that the electrons revolving in these orbitals do not radiate energy. Now this is justified when we use the term energy levels because it indicates that each shell has got a defined energy level. That means when the electrons revolve in these shells, they do not liberate any form of energy. And how do we name these shells to indicate their position? It's simple. Beginning from the one near the nucleus, we name them as the K shell, L shell, M shell, N shell and so on. Yes, K, L, M, N and so on. And what if we want to number them? In that case, we use the letter N in lowercase and write them as N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3 and so on beginning from the one next to the nucleus. So we can name them alphabetically or we can even number them. With all these theories and points known, do we now know the structure of a typical atom completely? The nucleus contains positive protons and the electrons revolving around in fixed orbitals. Is that how an atom is structured? Not really. We still have one more subatomic particle left. And what and where could it be? Let's find that out. It was around the year 1932 when a famous English physicist, Sir James Chadwick, found the third subatomic particle. He found that the particle had a mass almost equivalent to that of the proton. And what about its charge? Astonishingly, it had no charge. Yes. The particle was neutral. The particle was later named as neutron, denoted by the letter N. Thus, now we have the complete design of an atom. In the center lies the nucleus having positively charged protons and neutral neutrons, while the negatively charged electrons revolve in fixed orbitals around the nucleus. But how exactly are the electrons distributed in the respective orbitals? Is there a way to find out the maximum number of electrons that one orbital can contain? Or is it that the electrons are randomly scattered in the orbitals? Let's find out the... Okay. So, you have seen the atomic model of the atomic model, but the draw of it was that spectral lines are not in the explanation. The other thing is that this is a single electron atom या दो इलेक्ट्रॉन एटम की स्पेक्ट्रा को एक्सप्लेन कर सकता है बाकी को एक्सप्लेन नहीं कर सकता नीनी नी हाइड्रोजन के स्पेक्ट्रा में आपके पास इंफ्रारेड से लेकर अल्ट्रावायलेट तक के रेडिएशन है उससे ऊपर की जो एक्सरे वगैरह है वो आपको दिखाई नहीं देते लेकिन जहाँ पर कम्प्लेक्स एटम्स आते हैं तो कम्प्लेक्स एटम के स्पेक्ट्रा को ये एक्सप्लेन करने से कासर है दैट इज़ अन एबल टू एक्सप्लेन दी स्पेक्ट्रा ऑफ कम्प्लेक्स एटम्स वगैरह वगैरह तो आप मजीद जो है वो देखते जाओ ठीक है ना